Hello everyone, I'm Santanaka. Nice to meet you. Today, I will introduce a method to make a network environment that relies on a router more convenient. As shown in the video, in most households, internet connections are managed by a single router. Therefore, let's revamp this router-dependent environment and build a new network environment. After explaining, we will actually construct it. Here is the new network environment we will be setting up. Most laptops have both Wi-Fi and wired physical network devices, so we will utilize them. This laptop has a Ubuntu 24.04 installed and is responsible for network segmentation. This may be niche, but it sounds interesting. So, can we think of this laptop as supporting the internet connection of computers on different networks? Yes, Smoothie, that's great. Before moving on to the practical part, let me explain a bit more. The area in the red frame represents the existing network environment where primarily Wi-Fi supported devices like smartphones connect. Then, we will configure the area in the green frame to set up a new network configuration. In the previous network environment, we tried to install the OS over the network using PXE during installation, but the functions of the router and DHCP server overlapped, causing it not to work as intended. There are other benefits as well, so let's configure this laptop. This is very helpful. Thank you. It's convenient to copy and paste, so we'll work by connecting to the laptop via SSH. Additionally, using VS Code allows us to directly edit files on the remote PC through the VS Code editor, which is very convenient. Please watch this video as well if you like. After this, we will check the network status of this laptop. I see, it's easier to understand if we check this before configuring network segmentation. Yes. Also, Ubuntu has just been installed with only Docker installed. When we check the IP address status, it looks like this. The first interface is the loopback interface, used for the system to communicate with itself internally. The second and third interfaces are physical network devices on this PC, assigned IP addresses by the router. The second one is the wired device, and the third one is the Wi-Fi device. The last one is the virtual network interface created by installing Docker. In this video, we won't be using Docker, but it is installed to check the network. The first low interface is a basic network interface that always exists when you install Ubuntu, right? Yes, it is used for the system to communicate with itself internally and always has the same IP address assigned. Now, we will change the current IP settings. Ubuntu's network configuration management methods vary depending on the version. In recent versions of Ubuntu, files like the ones shown in the video are not used. Instead, a tool called NetPlan is used. Therefore, I am checking the files in NetPlan. So, this file contains the network settings, correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, I will add this file to configure the settings as desired. This is a typical home network setup that relies on the router. Both wired and wireless connections use DHCP to automatically obtain IP addresses. You can manage with copy-pasting without memorizing the syntax. Also for wireless connections, you connect to a specific Wi-Fi network and use a password for that. DHCP is a mechanism that automatically assigns IP addresses to devices on the network. We can connect to the Internet effortlessly thanks to this function. To separate the network as shown in the diagram, we will rewrite the configuration file. Detailed instructions on how to write it can be found in the link in the video description. What we're doing is writing a new network on the wired side while not making any particular changes to the Wi-Fi side. We then save the changes. So, by changing this file, the IP address on the wired side will change, right? Yes. After entering the command to apply the changes immediately, let's check. If you are operating remotely, the network might be temporarily disconnected. Let's check the IP address status again. Oh, the IP address has changed. With this change, 
the devices on the wide side will be able to communicate within the same segment. Hearing this, some might think the following. Um, can devices connected to this wired side access the internet? No. Currently, devices on the wired side can only communicate within the internal network and cannot access the internet. To enable internet access, we first need to enable IP forwarding. IP forwarding is a function that forwards packets received on one network interface to another network interface. By enabling this, the server PC will function as a router, allowing other devices on the network to access the internet. It's not straightforward. To enable it permanently, we'll edit the file. So, if a PC has two devices, does IP forwarding mean connecting them? Ah, uh, yes, even if a single PC has multiple network devices, it refers to the function of forwarding packets between those devices. By default, IP forwarding is not enabled. And since we have changed the private IP address on the wired side to a different one, we also need to enable the NAT function. NAT is a technology that allows devices within a network to access the Internet by translating their private IP addresses into public IP addresses that can be used on the Internet. This diagram shows how the router performs that role. The overall flow is as follows. The important point here is that the laptop uses NAT to translate private addresses into other private addresses. This is sometimes referred to as local network NAT or internal NAT. Now, we will proceed with that configuration. Thank you. I kind of understand, but isn't this configuration difficult? No, it's not difficult at all. You can manage with copy-pasting. Since it's within the local network, I remember experimenting with it several times in the past. When I worked for a company, I used to change network routes out of curiosity, and it never really got noticed. As a result, I was able to see various things. Of course, I left it as it was when I left the company. Anyway, let's get back to work. Now, let's enter the command to configure NAT. If you want to try this yourself, please adjust the device names to fit your environment. Since the settings will be reset upon reboot, you need to make the configuration persistent. So, we'll install the tool to make the configuration persistent. After installation, be sure to save the IP table rules with a dedicated command. Running this command will save all the currently configured IP table rules, ensuring they are maintained even after the system is rebooted. Oh, so there's such a convenient tool. Are these packages not installed by default? No, it seems that they need to be installed additionally. Now, let's use Windows as a client to test. Connect the wide side of the server to Windows via a hub. And here is the actual Windows screen. On the Windows PC, Wi-Fi is disabled. Because if it were enabled, it would connect to the router, making the test meaningless, even if the internet could be accessed. What we are going to do now is manually enter an IP address on the wired side that is in the same segment as the server. Hearing this, some might think the following. Can we assign IP addresses automatically instead of manually? It seems possible. Indeed, when connected to a router, IP addresses are automatically assigned and Internet access is granted because the router's DHCP function is enabled. In fact, this laptop used as a server can also have this function added, but I plan to cover that in a future video. Now that we have manually entered the IP address, let's check if the connection works. The expected network behavior should be as shown in the video. To test this, we will check using the command prompt. This IP address is the same as the one we entered earlier. We will also enter the ping command to check if it can reach the server. We successfully sent a ping to the wired side of the server PC and confirmed connectivity. Next, let's check if we can ping a server on the internet. Looking at these results, it seems that while local connections are successful, internet connectivity is not working. We need to reconsider this. Just to be sure, let's also check using a browser. Although it didn't work several times, I'll introduce the method that solved the issue. 
one possible reason why internet connectivity failed, despite setting up IP forwarding and NAT, is that traffic through the loopback interface was not permitted. The loopback interface is a virtual network interface used to send data to the computer itself. This interface is used when the computer accesses itself via the network. Therefore, we need to allow all incoming traffic passing through the loopback interface. We also need to allow all outgoing traffic passing through the loopback interface. Additionally, we need to allow traffic from the internal network. It is usually necessary to allow response traffic from the internet as well. This is because permitting responses to requests sent from the internal network to the external network ensures proper communication. I don't think swimsuits are relevant here, but it's essential for accessing websites, sending and receiving emails, and using online services. Yes. By entering this command, we will gradually resolve the issues. I forgot to mention there is something called the default policy, which is set to drop all traffic that is not explicitly allowed. This is something easy to forget, but we will save what we have done so far. Now, let's check again on Windows. If there are any issues, we will address them. Just like before, we will use the ping command to ping a server on the internet. Oh, this time it looks promising. Yes, let's open a browser to check. It worked. We have now successfully set up the network as intended. Next, I will introduce the commands that solved this issue. We are checking the post routing chain in the NAT table. And if it is displayed like this, the rules have been added correctly. Without the NAT configuration, it will not be possible to connect from the internal network to the internet. Therefore, if it is displayed as shown in the video, it indicates an unexpected result. Allowing traffic for the loopback interface, which we struggled with earlier, should have been checked first. The output not only shows the rules for the loopback interface, but also all other rules. If the accept rule is not displayed, it might not be working correctly. Regarding output, the principle is the same, only the direction is different. The third command displays all the rules in the forward chain in detail. This should have been addressed in the earlier part of the video. Therefore, when you run this command, the physical network devices should be displayed, which simply means that there are rules set for those devices in the forward chain. In the next video based on this, I will discuss how to set up a DHCP and PXE server. That sounds exciting. Looking forward to it. See you all next time. Goodbye.